folks. Once again, thanks for joining us for Optimal Spectrum Scenarios for 4G and 5G networks. Our moderator for this discussion is the VP of Spectrum Planning at CTIA. Let's give a big round of applause to Paul Aniskevich. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Aniskevich, and thank you for saying my name right, by the way, uh, since I told you you don't get the $20 uh, that I give out. But um, anyway, and each of you would get a $10 prize if you can say my name right at the end of this. Uh, anyway, my name is Paul Aniskevich. I'm VP of uh, Spectrum Planning for CTIA. Thank you for attending uh, the panel discussion this afternoon, especially right after the lunch hour. We trust that you'll find the, uh, some of the insights from our panel very insightful and helpful um, as we um, go through the different spectrum scenarios as we roll out 5G. Um, today we welcome Paige Atkins. Paige is Associate Direct Administrator of NTIA. Uh, Paige will start us off in a few minutes with her remarks. Uh, next to Paige is Chris Helzer. Chris is uh, Chief Engineer from the FCC at the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. And I've got uh, Durga uh, Malati. D Durga is Senior Vice President of uh, Engineering for Qualcomm. And then uh, next to him is Steve Sarkey. Steve is Vice President of Technology and Engineering Policy at T-Mobile USA. And last but not least is Charlie Zhang. Charlie is Vice President of uh, Research for Samsung. So our panelists will provide a, a brief set of remarks and then we'll field questions uh, of a set of questions that I've put together and some of our panelists have put together. And then at the end we'll take some uh, open questions. Uh, our speakers will explore the opportunities uh, presented in the high bands. Um, so thank you, Chris, for some of the hard work you and Paige have been doing. And then some of the unique properties around millimeter wave. Um, also, we'll ask Charlie and Durga to talk about what that takes in terms of development of products um, as we get ready to deploy. And then we'll talk to Steve really about what it's going to be to deploy these technologies. We'll discuss the merits also about um, exclusive use spectrum for vice shared spectrum and some of the challenges around what uh, Steve and his team at T-Mobile would have deploying in each one of those uh, scenarios. Paige, if you could be so kind to start us off, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. You all awake? <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank CTIA for inviting me to be part of this panel. This, this really is an exciting time with regard to wireless technology. And we continue to propel our, ourselves forward to a 5G world. And we, none of us can wait until we, we get there. And at the same time, we continue to enhance 4G services. And I'm going to be discussing NTIA's role in improving the nation's spectrum stewardship, collaborating with the commission, the federal agencies, and industry to ensure that spectrum is available to fuel these technology innovations from a commercial wireless standpoint. For those of you that are not familiar with NTIA, we are the principal advisor to the president on telecommunications and information policy issues. And a key uh, element of our function is to manage all federal government spectrum use. So we work very closely with the FCC in that regard who manages all non-federal spectrum use. So we've heard a lot already about the tremendous advances in wireless technology, 4G, 5G, and perhaps beyond uh, this morning. And I wanted to highlight that we've also made critical advances to government services. To include, for instance, when you get on that plane at the end of the week to go home, Spectrum helps ensure that you get to your destination safely. It also allows for you to watch a hurricane coming towards your city and know that you'll have adequate warning to protect your family and your property. It also allows us to tell the American public that we're watching the skies and helping to prevent terrorist attacks from occurring on our soil, among many other government services that are provided. We should never forget that consumers are also citizens, and all of us should have the best technology access and applications for both of those roles. And an essential element to all of that is spectrum. Without spectrum, the world we know today would not exist. And we continue to work with our partners, again, the commission, the federal agencies, and industry to ensure that we're providing the spectrum access that's needed 
for all of these uh, critical functions. So one of NTIA's top priorities is the 500 megahertz goal. And I, I hope that most of you have heard about the 500 megahertz goal uh, by now, but this was the direction from President Obama to work with the FCC and identify 500 megahertz of spectrum for commercial broadband applications by the year 2020. We've been very successful to date, and that's been based on strong interagency processes as well as uh, strengthening collaboration with industry in particular. And you heard about some of that this morning. Chairman Wheeler mentioned AWS 3, 3.5 gigahertz. Those are some of the accomplishments and some of the spectrum that has, um, has been presented against this 500 megahertz goal. Incentives is the next big chunk that uh, the FCC is working as we speak. And then we're also focused on five gigahertz for unlicensed devices. And we are working again with the agencies, the commission and industry to make that happen. But we continue to look beyond. We are working with the federal agencies to assess federal spectrum use within five bands between 1300 and 3550 megahertz. And this is called a quantitative assessment where we're better characterizing how the agencies use that spectrum, which will help us then prioritize and identify which of those bands, if any, would be uh, good candidates for more detailed assessments for repurposing to commercial use. And I'll go back to that in a moment. The Spectrum Pipeline Act, which was enacted last year, also was a key component in terms of allowing the federal agencies to leverage spectrum relocation funds or auction proceeds for advanced spectrum planning as well as research and development in making additional spectrum, again, think beyond the 500 megahertz, available for commercial use. And as an example of how we're leveraging uh, these components, the FAA announced, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, that they are working in conjunction with the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as NOAA, uh, to look at how they might collapse radar systems that are in 1300 to 1350, again, one of the quantitative assessment bands. And they are going to submit a proposal for those pipeline funds to study and assess whether they can collapse those radars and if successful, potentially free up spectrum for either non-federal use exclusively or shared use since there are some other systems that will remain in the band. And we will continue to leverage all of these uh, facets that we have available to us to achieve 500 megahertz as well as beyond. Now as we look at 5G, and this has been said before, it's not one thing. It's a collection of capabilities that have to satisfy a diverse set of requirements that require a diverse set of technical characteristics. And as we know, spectrum is not all equal, and we have to apply spectrum in the right way to satisfy the different services that we're trying to achieve. So we know we need a mix of low, mid, high, very high band spectrum. And we, we have heard clearly from industry over the last year that one of the key gaps has been in the high spectrum. Uh, and that today, as Meredith mentioned this morning, uh, we have matured the technology to a point that we can apply these bands in a way that we never thought would be achievable a few years ago. So we're very excited about the opportunities for Spectrum Frontiers, not only to fill that gap, but it opens up new opportunities for federal and non-federal sharing, licensed and unlicensed use, as well as dual use technologies. How can we apply this evolving 5G uh, technology base and standards for other applications that we may not have even thought of today for uh, public and private sector requirements? Now, though, we'll continue to look for opportunities for relocation and licensed application. Sharing is and will continue to be an important component to improving spectrum access for both public and private sector users. 
because the requirements are growing across the board. And the characteristics that make a spectrum attractive for 4G and 5G services also make them attractive for critical government functions that we're trying to provide to the public. And so we need to figure out innovative methods of better sharing that spectrum, and not just non-federal use users sharing federal spectrum, but also federal users potentially sharing non-federal spectrum, because that will allow us to better optimize across all of these critical uses. We also need to do it in a way that creates some certainty around investments, again, both public and private sector investments and operations. So we need to apply an all of the above strategy, and, and Meredith has, has talked about that in the past as well. We need to effectively refarm spectrum that's out in the marketplace today, deploy the spectrum that's been made available via AWS 3 and other mechanisms, the 500 megahertz goal, apply a variety of frequency bands, leverage new technologies to enable sharing, and fully embrace licensed and unlicensed uses and services. So we'll continue to work with the commission, the agencies, and industry to look at all of these options and ensure that we have the spectrum access we need to fuel technology innovation in the wireless world and to maximize the consumer, business, economic, scientific, safety, and national security interests that are all so critical to our nation. Now, key to the success is collaboration, not only between government and industry operators and users, but also across research, development, testing, and evaluation. We must collaborate and build trust, not only in the technology, but also in the process, the policies, uh, and the other activities that are required to actually implement the technology. And collaboration and trust will help us fully exploit the opportunities ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Chris? Thanks. These go here. Mm. We have slides, great. Okay, your clicker's up there. Does this function? Okay. So yeah, I'm Chris Helzer. I'm Chief Engineer in the Wireless Bureau at the FCC. And since we're talking about Spectrum for 5G, I thought I would talk about that briefly. So I think, first of all, Chairman Wheeler talked about this a little bit this morning. Our policy is, is to not try to get in the nitty gritty, so we don't have bands that are specified for 5G. We have technology neutral bands. And so to start with, there's a lot of existing Spectrum that from a regulatory point of view could be used for 5G. Maybe, maybe it's not practical you know, depending on refarming and so forth. But there, there's no prohibition against trying to do 5G in the AWS band or the PCS band or the cellular band or the 700 band. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that may actually be 5G, and I would say that applies to the unlicensed bands as well. You know, there may be, there may be applications that are 5G-like in the existing unlicensed bands. So I, I think that's important to keep in mind. A page just talked about the 500 megahertz goal under the uh, National Broadband Plan. And under that plan, we've had a lot of flexible use spectrum come online recently. Um, we did WS, WCS RNO. That's, I put the LTE band numbers up here for those of you who like to keep track of LTE band numbers. Some people know these as band 30. Uh, we did an RNO, a report and order on AWS 4. It's another 40 megahertz. We auctioned the H block. I think it's not last year, but the year before at this point. I'm losing track. Yep. And of course, the AWS 3 auction was a very big auction for us. And that's quite a bit of spectrum, 65 megahertz of spectrum. Um, we have the 3.5 band, which we have a report and order out. We are, that's a little more complicated. That has this spectrum access system, and we're reviewing applications for providers of that, that system right now. And the 600 megahertz incentive auction, which is more low band spectrum, is going on right now actually closed one stage and are gonna start another stage next week. Um, so we have all that, we have all these existing bands, but we've also been working on what we've been calling spectrum frontiers, what a lot of people are calling high band spectrum this morning, now that all of a sudden you have to be over six gigahertz to be high band now. Um, and so we just did this report in order that freed up almost 11 gigahertz of spectrum uh, in three main bands, 28 gigahertz, which is gonna be licensed, area licensed, 
uh, two 425 megahertz blocks. So instead of 40 megahertz blocks, we're now talking 400 megahertz blocks in these very high frequency bands. Um, 37 to 40 gigahertz, three gigahertz of spectrum, also area licensed in 200 blocks. There we're going to look into some sharing mechanisms in the bottom 600. And also more unlicensed spectrum. There's existing unlicensed spectrum that's very high called the Y gig band you may be familiar with. And we add another seven gigahertz adjacent to that existing band. In addition to all that, we have, I tend to hit the wrong button on this thing. When we put out the report in order, we also put out this further notice and we queued up another 18 gigahertz of bands that we're proposing. This is still in the comment period. Uh, we'll be getting a lot of feedback from industry on these bands or other bands and how, how they should come out, but these are other bands we're looking at. And it's quite a bit of additional spectrum and it's all the way from 24 gigahertz up to over 95 gigahertz. So that's kind of a quick overview of some of the spectrum that could be available for 5G that's, that we're trying to make available for industry to use in whatever is the best, best method to get to 5G and, and enhancements to 4G as well. Great. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Oh, I forgot Steve. to thank Paul for inviting me to the panel. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. <laughs> Always good to see you. Steve, if we could get your industry perspective real quick. Sure. Um, and I'll just do it from sitting, if that's fine. But um, frankly, the uh, comments from, from Paige and Chris were great. In fact, Paige's comments are pretty much mirror what I would say. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it really is, <laughs> really is an exciting time right now for both spectrum and technology, and we're seeing huge amounts of change. Um, you know, we continue to grow and do more with our 4G LTE technology. I don't know if you've, uh, we had some announcements yesterday for T-Mobile where uh, we announced that we've been deploying 4x4 MIMO. 256 QAM, and that we've been doing um, carrier aggregation, both two and three channel carrier aggregation since uh, 2014 um, using our PCS, AWS, and 700 megahertz spectrum. So, you know, we're at a point now where you combine these technologies and you can get download speeds up to uh, 400 megabits per second. Yeah, it's being rolled out very quickly, very aggressively, and uh, and it is a very competitive environment for continually um, upgrading these. Changes in uh, 5G that, uh, or um, fifth generation technology that we're seeing, we're working with our partners, Ericsson, Nokia, we just announced um, work with Samsung that we're doing to study and, um, and develop that technology. Uh, and there's no, we use lots of talk about the benefits of, in terms of latency and speed and improved in customer experience that that's going to bring um, as that gets deployed. And big changes in, uh, in spectrum. It was very recent where three gigahertz was kind of as high as we were looking for, for mobile spectrum. Um, both, both Paige and Chris uh, and others have talked about the Spectrum Frontiers bands that um, uh, are being made available or, you know, with the port and order have been made available and are being looked at uh, more. Um, 600 megahertz spectrum uh, auction that's going on right now, the AWS 3 auction that's recent, 3.5. So there really is uh, actually a pretty good um, range of both of low, mid-band and high-band spectrum that's um, being evaluated and looked at. And as Paige mentioned, some more mid-band spectrum that's really, um, again, critical to filling in um, the footprint of the networks and meeting the demand. I think the, you know, with all this activity, um, I think some of the comments from the chairman this morning were, were very on point too, though. The need for, um, for there to continue to be competition for Spectrum. Um, you know, one of the things as we look at, particularly in Spectrum Frontiers, where we're, a lot of Spectrum has been made available, and when you look at 11 gigahertz of Spectrum, that is a pretty amazing amount of Spectrum um, off the bat. But when you really look at it, a high percentage of that is already licensed, um, so it's a uh, a smaller percentage that's actually available for auction, particularly uh, in major metropolitan areas. So there's certainly a need for the commission to um, have policies in place around spectrum holdings to make sure that 
uh, one or two companies aren't able to come in and, and get all of that spectrum um, because all the carriers need, need competitive access. Licensed spectrum versus unlicensed spectrum. The kind of investment that we're seeing driven through LTE and into fifth generation technologies is really a result of licensed spectrum um, and the kind of uh, certainty around investment that licensed spectrum um, brings, uh, brings with it. And you know, we need to make sure that that continues, that there is a sufficient amount of spectrum. In the spectrum frontiers uh, where a uh, seven gigahertz of spectrum was allocated for, um, for unlicensed versus about 3.25 gigahertz really for licensed spectrum, tips the scales from what we've seen traditionally in a more balanced view of licensed versus unlicensed spectrum in, in other bands. Um, so we need to make sure that, uh, I think that that balance continues, that there is a, a healthy mix of licensed versus unlicensed. And Paige talked about the opportunities for sharing and new opportunities for sharing between um, federal users and, uh, and non-federal commercial users. And it's absolutely right, and we're, you know, we're doing a lot with that. Um, 3.5 gigahertz band, it's got a lot of sharing opportunities. Um, and breaks new ground in sharing. The 37 to 37.6 gigahertz band will be a whole new um, area for innovation there. And we certainly support that, but we need to make sure that um, we take it in measured steps. There is a lot of work to be done um, around sharing and developing those models, and a lot of it's around the trust that Paige talked about, both in getting um, comfortable with some new sharing um, regimes, developing, improving the, te the technology works, um, and making sure that, we're, uh, that all the mix of users are able to meet their requirements without undermining um, the certainty necessary to drive that investment. So there's, um, I, you know, I, I don't think I've been doing spectrum management for a probably 30 years or so, and uh, this is certainly, I think, the biggest mix of change uh, that I've seen, and it's an exciting time, um, but we need to make sure that there is some kind of fundamental eye on um, ensuring that things that have worked can continue while we transition into some of the newer, um, uh, newer technologies and regulatory structures. Thank you, Steve. Durga, we'd like to ask you to come up and, uh, and show us your slides, sure. tell us from a different point of view, we've gotten the government perspective, we've gotten the operator perspective. What is your perspective and how is Qualcomm leading the way in terms of technology deployment? Sure. So uh, I'm going to keep it brief and the slides are really for a backdrop for everything that I'm going to speak. Uh, you know, as we've transitioned from analog voice to digital voice, 1G to 2G, and then digital voice plus data from 2G to 3G, and then eventually uh, into mobile broadband, which truly unleashed in, in the 4G uh, uh, era. As we look at 5G, I think it's important to understand the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve, and that will set a trend towards what kind of spectrum do we really need. It's an enabler towards all the use cases that we are talking of. At this point in time in the industry, it's a pretty reasonably good consensus that there are three broad uh, categories of uh, use cases that we are trying to uh, address using 5G. The first one is uh, mobile broadband, but significant enhancements on top of that. And this uses a combination of low, mid, and high uh, bands uh, but it's about higher data rates, peak rates, and average data rates, increasing amount of bandwidth on a per device basis, the usage of all the technologies that we've been working on over the last 10 years, ranging from MIMO towards analog beam forming as we get into the millimeter wave band and so on. So it's all about the peak rates in terms of gigabits per second and average rates, which are significantly higher than what we see today. And uh, if you take a look at the millimeter wave band, millimeter wave band uh, in the U.S., uh, the 27.5 to 28.3, uh, 28.35, uh, and take a look at that 800 megahertz, you get to about 5 gigabits per second peak rate making certain assumptions. And in, uh, in other continents, we've seen uh, this band being 27.5 to 29.5, 32 gigahertz, 37 to 40, et cetera. So the enhanced mobile broadband space is something that's well understood. We know exactly what we need to do there. There's a lot of work in terms of getting the RFIC technology in place, but we know that space very well. But really, 5G, the reason we call it as a 
more transformational uh, change from where we started off in 4G is because we are trying to address a very large number of use cases that we probably don't understand completely well anyway. And we actually have a good sense of some of them, but there are probably use cases that will come in further down the road. And in that sense, we want to make sure that we have something that is future-proof and, and forward compatible and uh, make sure that we can address these use cases as they come in. So let's start with something that we call as mission-critical services. These are services that demand extremely stringent latencies and uh, error rates which are significantly lower than what we see today. We actually don't care about the peak data rates here at all. I'm sending a packet from point A to point B, and you want to get down to maybe a 10 power minus 6 error rate and latencies which are less than one millisecond, something that we simply cannot do today. Some of these applications we know, some of these applications we don't know, but we're building a network that can do that. And this is probably one of those places where we are talking of ultra-reliable communications and perhaps license spectrum comes in as an important piece because reliability is key here. It's not about best effort services. And if you take a look at the, the final, uh, the third uh, uh, vertex in the triangle that you might have seen in multiple places, Massive Internet of Things. Now, Internet of, the Internet of Things is a very broad term. It can range from uh, water meters, gas meters, to connected smartwatches and so on. But the key is to have very good penetration in terms of deep coverage going way beyond what we are used to today. And that means that there is a good reason to start thinking about the lower bands, the sub-gigahertz bands, and these bands are important. So I'm going to actually explain the remaining part of uh, you know, two or three slides on this as to where do we see different pieces of the spectrum coming into play. So it's a very busy slide over here, and I kind of thought about it before putting it up here, but I thought it's a good point to actually indicate the different kinds of problems that we are trying to solve. On one hand, if you take a look at it on the, I guess from uh, uh, the left-hand side, we have very dense deployments with integrated backhaul and access. We're trying to cut that cord even for uh, uh, the wireline backhaul and trying to see what we can do with that. And the usage of the higher bands actually does become important over there because we need that bandwidth to be extremely large. At the same time, this bandwidth, because it's in the higher bands, makes it naturally amenable towards spectrum sharing. Propagation doesn't actually go that far, and in that sense, reuse of spectrum becomes easier. A couple of decades back, we never used to share spectrum as much, and today we are very comfortable with that in 2.4 gigahertz, upcoming 3.5 gigahertz, and in 5 gigahertz. So we know how to do this, and there are better and advanced techniques that we are working on to make sure that we can do spectrum sharing in the nice way. So this is one set of uh, uh, use cases. And on the right-hand side, we can see that there are different kinds of other applications. These can range from vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, smart meters, uh, the usage of ultra-reliable links for drone control, and uh, narrowband IoT, uh, which relies upon perhaps a mesh backhaul. And that relies upon different kinds of spectrum uh, usage. You can actually think of the mid-band to high-band as probably a place where we can do that. So the number of requirements that we talk of on 5G NR, these are half self-imposed, but these are also anticipatory in the sense we see these trends. These are the kinds of things that we want to solve. Uh, we clearly see the need to use all three areas, the low bands, the mid bands, and the high bands, and the usage of licensed and shared slash unlicensed spectrum paradigms. I think that's going to be key from our standpoint uh, for 5G. So in terms of deployments itself, uh, as we start using these higher bands, let's take a simple example of mobile broadband. This is a place wherein we see deployments coming up. Today we have 4G uh, and Wi-Fi in the lower bands. And as the higher bands come in, both in millimeter wave and also slightly above the 3.5 gigahertz today, we see a way of using the lower bands as an anchor carrier, something that gives us an assurance for guaranteed, uh, you never literally drop the call, even though that whole phrase has lost its meaning when it comes to packet services. But it's a way of making sure that we always maintain connectivity using any or all of the above radios, Wi-Fi, LTE, and 5G. So different spectrum paradigms are kind of important uh, in terms of the deployment or the rollout of 5G networks. And in that sense, speaking a little bit more about spectrum sharing, we've just scratched the surface from our perspective on what we really mean by spectrum sharing over there. We started off with a purely unlicensed domain where everyone can get in and has some sort of a, a, an access. But as we start taking a look at 3.5 gigahertz today, there are those which have a slightly higher tier. So this is called as vertical sharing versus horizontal sharing. It's a very interesting structure. And in 3.5 gigahertz, it's becoming quite important. And we therefore broadly classified that under the overall shared spectrum paradigm. It's a shared spectrum in the sense that there are certain 
rules which are not necessarily equivalent to what we do or usually used to with listen before talk techniques and sensing techniques that we do normally in 2.4 and, uh, and 5 gigahertz. And there are different things that we can do in this spe shared spectrum, defining new rules of operation so that we can extract the maximum out of these, uh, out of these bands. So much innovation has gone into the license spectrum in this, from the cellular standpoint, we can bring that innovation into unlicensed and shared spectrum paradigm and get the best out of it. That's our perspective. And I'm going to stop over here by simply stating that as we take a look at different kinds of uh, 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 the bands that were recently uh, announced by FCC, including the 7 gigahertz and 60 gigahertz band, and uh, uh, the 3 gigahertz and the 37 to 40 gigahertz, we are kind of excited about it. We feel that these bands are kind of important as we go out and deploy uh, 5G. Thanks. Fabulous, Durga. Thank you very much. Charlie, if you wouldn't mind uh, also providing your thoughts about from your perspective. Okay, sure. Um, Whatever you're comfortable with, Charlie. Oh, okay. <laughs> Looks like this mic is working, so okay. I can probably just stand here. Uh, thanks, Paul, for having us here. Um, and uh, we, we, we are really proud Samsung is one of the uh, very early pioneers in the 5G technology study and innovation. So we, we've been working on this starting from 2011. It's been almost uh, half a decade. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have seen a lot of challenge in the process. We uh, learned a lot of lesson uh, when we're trying to build the, uh, the, the first set of uh, 5G system and make it work in the process. And be very happy to share some of that with, with you here. I don't have any slides here. Uh, maybe a very brief summary uh, uh, over time what we did. Uh, I would say, broadly, broadly speaking, there's two stages that we experienced. Initially from two, uh, 2011, uh, when we first started looking at this problem, especially for these new frequency opportunities in higher bands, and by the way, thanks to, to uh, Chris and, uh, and Paige to, to make that available in US, uh, thanks to your leadership, that's very critical actually for us to, to be able to go out there and build technology for that and make 5G happen. So uh, when we started, everything was open. There's so many challenges. I mean, we, we don't even have a channel model we don't know this whole thing works or not. We don't have we don't we don't have component technology. We don't have a PA that working in those bands, 28 gigahertz, um, and we 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 don't know how to build these uh, very simple RF components that that's very simple in lower bands. For example, the filters, the active antenna arrays, and so on. So, for those years, we focused on building these fundamental component technologies. We worked with uh, many of our partners across the world to build a, uh, a, a reasonably uh, well-designed channel model so we can simulate and understand the behavior of the system in these new, new bands. We also uh, spend a lot of time and resource developing our own uh, antenna arrays for those new bands, uh, semiconductor components including PA, filters, and so on. Then we also spend time to put them together to do uh, uh, over the air a demo so we can convince ourselves it is indeed feasible. It's working over the distance of, you know, a few hundred kilometers, uh, sorry, a few hundred meters to a kilometer. So not, not that far, but it's good, but not that far. So, um, so everything went really well. It's amazing, actually. We, when we started, we didn't know whether it's going to work or not. Because at that time, the prevailing sort of understanding for those bands is if it's line of sight, if you have really a, a very high gain antenna array, uh, like the one you see in the dish array, then you can make it work, line of sight situation. But for non line of sight situation, nobody knows. So we actually spend a lot of time to, you know, to, to convince ourselves, convince uh, uh, the community and uh, the, the, the other partners in the ecosystem that indeed this is actually a, a feasible band for us to deploy uh, wide area cellular networks. And then for the second stage, starting from 2014, we have been focusing on the actual commercialization of this technology to make sure that we can bring this to the real life. So we, we um, on top of those, uh, uh, those technology and uh, component technology we developed in the first stage, we trying to put them together and focusing on more on the optimization, trying to bring down the power consumption, make this uh, cellular technology go a little bit further uh, in distance and make sure that, that the, uh, the, the, the cost is under control. So we, 
you know, there's also many other aspects of the building a cellular network. It's, radio is very important, but that's not all of it. We also need to figure out how to build a multi base station handover system, virtualization of 5G systems so that radio and network architecture can be built together to support all these new use cases that we saw earlier uh, from Durga uh, and, and others. So uh, very happy to, to share that this process is uh, very well underway. Uh, we are working together with uh, uh, several operators, both in Korea as well as in the United States, to keep this going. Uh, initial use case, as many of you probably heard, will likely be in the uh, fixed wireless access. But we are also seeing that we, you know, once we gain more experience from that, we'll definitely take it one step further and, and go to the full mobility case uh, in the coming years. Okay, thanks. Great. That's fabulous, Charlie. Thank you. So now a couple of questions for each one of the panelists, and I'd kind of like you to think through it. So first of all, Chris, I noticed in your slides that you had talked about, uh, for example, in the NPRM, you were open up additional bands. Uh, how did the commission come about those particular bands, especially as, in my case, I've noticed quite a few of them are, um, have federal incumbents already in them or other things. Can you share some light on maybe that process and then how you would like us to, as an industry to work with, with Paige and her team and your team to, to put those you know, in use? Well, we picked them through our normal process. Okay. I mean, this is all following on from, well, it goes way back, actually. So, you know, our, we have this uh, council called the Technological Advisory Council that advised us to look at Millimeter Wave okay. a couple of years ago. And then we did a notice of inquiry, and we asked for a lot of input from industry. And, and we look at a lot of factors. We look at international harmonization. We look at what's going on with WRC. We look at incumbents. Mm -hmm. we, we talk with our federal partners. And we're just looking for bands that look feasible. Okay. That, the in, in, that the incumbent use looks like maybe something that could be shared or maybe something that's underutilized or that's highly utilized but, but similar, but wouldn't require a big rule change. There's, there's a lot of different factors, but, okay. but it's not like we make it in isolation. You know, we put out the NOI and we get a lot of feedback. Right. These are actually all bands, I think, probably all bands that wouldn't actually our original notice of proposed rulemaking. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are in the RNO are the ones that were the clearest that we could move forward on quickly, and these are the other ones. So, and, and the further notice is open. You know, any company can come in and comment at this point, and we really encourage that. You know, we want to. Great. And when we is want the to hear from close? I do not know off the top of my head. I might have somebody who knows. Okay. No. September 30th. No. September 30th? Yeah. September 30th. Right. So, Paige, based on what Chris just told us, what do you see as the challenges, benefits, but also opportunities? having coexistence between commercial and industry like Steve's company and um, federal users. And what can you tell us about that? Well, I think in general, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the more we can share, the better we can optimize to satisfy all user requirements. In some cases, sharing may not be feasible for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we move forward, for instance, with AWS 3, even though it, it was a licensed band, there were two critical elements that made AWS 3 successful. Collaboration with industry, in particular intense collaboration, as well as sharing. And that's sharing during transition, as well as some indefinite sharing with federal users in the band. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to move forward with AWS 3, and you wouldn't have had that spectrum available for use today. So it's. It's a critical component to our success. Millimeter wave opens up new opportunities just inherent in the technical characteristics of the band. And new techniques like spectrum access systems, environmental sensing. We have the regulatory framework in place for 3.5. Now we have to prove out those technologies and prove out the processes and policies around them. And it just offers huge potential for the future. Okay, so Paige, a follow-on question, in your opinion, what steps are necessary to build those? If you could give us a recipe for success, for example, you mentioned AWS 3 as we go through in 3.5, as we go through in the high bands, what are the right collaborations? And Steve, I'm going to ask you a similar question because, Steve, you've lived it recently in particular, yeah. but what in your mind, Paige, is the right collaborations to build with the federal agencies? We made huge progress in AWS 3 using our Federal Advisory Committee, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, to facilitate an intense collaboration between industry and government 
of which Steve and his team participated uh, greatly in that process. And we continue to use similar methodologies, like as we look at five gigahertz for sharing with unlicensed, we're working with the commission and we have joint working groups for the federal agencies, industry, the commission, as well as ourselves to work out what the technical solutions may be, the operational solutions. So it's this very intense collaborative effort. And we continue to define how we can even better collaborate in the future. We're developing an industry government collaboration plan that NTIA can leverage to fill any gaps that we see. And we will be reaching out to uh, the community at large to ensure that we've got the right mechanisms in place to address the right issues so we can be successful in the future. That's great, Paige, thank you. So Steve, if I could get your perspective from the operator, how did that collaboration work in AWS 3 and what, what do you think are lessons learned or suggestions you might make for the process to be better as we go through the next set? I totally agree with Paige that we made huge progress in the AWS 3 process. And it really, it, you know, it comes around when you, I think the key was really getting the engineers to sit down in a room together and get into technical details of the system and what sharing means and what can work. When you talk at a high level, it's often much more contentious. People kind of back into their corners, but engineers, you know, kind of given the right instructions, will generally find a way to work through that. So I think that's the kind of thing that we need to see, you know, continue to see more of. And one of the keys, I think, with AWS 3 also was that rather than set hard limits on sharing, I mean, you know what systems need to be protected, um, parameters around a lot of those systems, uh, but coming out and following auction, there's a coordination process that's in place. And um, in that process, there's also room, and in the regulatory structure that was adopted, there is room to allow companies to work with incumbents to solve problems on an individual basis. So, you know, part of what we're doing now is going in and when, you know, DOD says, no, you can't deploy a system there. We're able to go in and talk with them and say, well, what, you know, let's understand the issue a little bit more and come up with some um, solutions that either let us deploy a larger area or get in closer or, you know, hopefully even deploy, you know, much more fully while protecting, um, protecting them. Probably, you know, one of the biggest challenges that in developing sharing is leaving a lot of flexibility for systems to develop and change over time. And that's probably a big, one of the bigger ones that we haven't always been as successful to, in developing a regulatory structure that um, allows complete flexibility for incumbents to modify systems um, while also providing assurance or certainty around kind of new um, entrance into the, into the market. So I, you know, I think we're learning a lot. Um, Paige mentioned before the need to, to uh, establish greater levels of trust, and the more we work together, I think that you know we'll see more of that. Especially for you know when you're working with large federal agencies, it takes a long time. You know, it's a, a lot of people that get involved. It takes a long time to kind of come from the top down into the troops. But the um, you know better the companies work with those agencies, uh, we, and we're actually seeing really good cooperation now from all the agencies. I think on um, especially AWS three, and to the extent that some of that model is now being extended up into other bands. Um, I think that will pay dividends. So Steve, kind of a follow on to that, to step more into millimeter wave, and Durga, I'd like you to weigh in here, um, if you would. If you looked at Durga's slide, Steve, what jumped out of the page at you, and where do you need uh, OEMs like Samsung and companies like Qualcomm to work with you to make this happen? So if we could start with you. And Charlie and Durga, I'd ask you yeah. to jump in if you have. Well, like I said, I mean, we're working very closely with, uh, with all of our vendors now to develop these technologies and understand them. A lot of learning and, um, you know, from how the, the, this spectrum is very different than anything we've dealt with before, right? And the technology is very different with beam forming um, uh, and different deployment schemes. So uh, I think it's really, you know, again, kind of getting in as, the, uh, as the vendors are developing their technologies, getting in and working with us to understand, you know, where the limits are on the on the deployment or the opportunities, and how different um, 
different frequency bands um, act, right? So whether it's 28 gigahertz or 39, are they substitutable or are there really differences that um, uh, you know, make you prefer one over the other? So Charlie, in the few minutes that we have left, a couple, of, so if you could share your thoughts there, but also share your thoughts on lessons learned that you mentioned in your uh, remarks earlier, if you would. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, de definitely, I think uh, these are all related. I completely agree with Steve that the, the collaboration from early stage is very critical. Actually, if there's one thing we learned is working in these new bands takes a long time. If there's no easy way because uh, the technology reserve is just not there yet. If you look at lower bands for two, uh, below three gigahertz, we have been working on this for the, for the last two or three decades. So there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience that's already been out there. We know how to build them. You know, of course, there's new um, you know, uh, technology from 2G to 3G to 4G. The, the waveform is different and so on, but fundamentally there's a lot of th things and technology that's already there. But when it comes to uh, 5G, especially these higher bands, we don't have them yet. Actually, we are building these uh, fundamental understanding as we go. So it's very important. And another thing is every band is different. So what you build for 28 doesn't necessarily carry over directly to 24. You still have to spend your time working with, uh, you know, for us, it's the ecosystem partners like, like T-Mobile and other carriers, as well as uh, the, the com component technology vendors. They will provide PA, they will provide RFIC and, and filters that's necessary to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, high level planning on figuring out where, where, where are the possible bands and what's the what's parameters of, of those bands and the timeline for that's very critical to do good planning. So Durga, you lead the way in a lot of ways at Qualcomm about, about some of that planning. Can you share with us your thoughts about that as we close? Yeah, sure. So in terms of, I was going to actually answer the question both in the high bands and the low bands. So if okay. you take a look at the high bands, the millimeter wave bands and so on, uh, it's been used in fixed wireless backhaul for a while. So that part is not fundamentally new. And a lot of the uh, key enabler from our perspective on, on 5G for mobile broadband is the ability to make it work in a mobile ecosystem. I mean, you want to be able to you know, hold on to a handset, you have a large number of antennas on it, and still be able to make it work with these extremely high data rates and in a power efficient manner. And that actually gets to the key of how do you make it mobile. It's a technology that is understood from a fixed wireless backhaul space. There's a lot of innovation that's coming there too, but still, it's kind of somewhat understood over there. But we've got to make it work in a mobile space. So usage of these beam tracking and beam forming techniques that have been done for fixed wireless, how do you make it work in a mobile environment by tracking the user as the user is walking around. The channel is now pretty well understood. I think a lot of challenges over the last five, six years have been kind of gradually overcome by understanding the channel and also improvements in the RFIC technology and so on. That's on the high bands. On the low bands, one of the points that I wanted to make is while the channel is well understood, the kinds of use cases that we are talking of are very different. We've never really gone to that extreme latency and such extreme reliability and then trying to make something out of it. I think. Uh, these are kind of challenging in itself, both in terms of what kind of devices actually need uh, this sort of a service and what are their characteristics in terms of cost and power consumption uh, and, and deeper penetration. For example, IoT devices, we talk of water meters that make up maybe once a day, send a, uh, you know, a couple of bytes of uh, data and then go back to sleep and they're supposed to be there for 10 years. This is a very different kind of a technology. So this is emerging. So therefore, from our standpoint, I think the, uh, the, the challenges that we see in 5G exist both in high bands and low bands. Mm -hmm. And the, the kinds of challenges are different, of course, but these challenges are, uh, exist everywhere. Fabulous, thank you. Um, now we'd like to open it up for a few questions. We're pretty close to our time, but again, if you've got some questions for our panelists, we would sincerely uh, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, name and company, please. Hi, I'm Howard Busker with Communications Daily. Uh, I had a question. Uh, today, Meredith Baker said that she hoped that the FCC would schedule the some of the high band auctions. Or, I, I mean, I don't know what that's going to look like in terms of how many auctions we're going to have, but that that would happen while Chairman Wheel was still in office. And I wanted to ask the panel, what's your expectation for when we're going to see some announcements on that, and when, when, will we, when will we likely see some kind of an auction of, of these new high frequency bands that were just opened up by the FCC? Chris? Chris. I'll say, I'll look, I'll look <laughs> to anybody else on the panel. Uh, you know, we, we, at the FCC, we do want to do it as soon as possible, but I can't put a time frame on that right now. 
Yeah, you kind of got your hands full with 600 megahertz and 3.5 and a few things. We have a lot going on with auctions, but we, we definitely would like to auction it. As, I mean, we're trying, Chairman Wheeler has made it a real priority that to, to try to show U.S. leadership in 5G, so obviously we want to do it as soon as we can, but I, I can't be more specific at this time. But Chris, let's take it a little further just for a second. You guys have also, uh, the chairman mentioned this morning that you're opening up a new process to be able to file to, for companies like Qualcomm, companies like Samsung, and especially companies like T-Mobile, um, to be able to put things out there for experimentation. And when is that gonna come online? You know, I do not actually know when that's coming online. Okay. We already have issued some experimental licenses. And, right, we know that. Know, mm -hmm. But I, I do not know when that is coming okay. online. That is outside my bureau. Or not outside my my, my uh, responsibility, not my problem, probably. <laughs> Other questions in the back here, Bob. Frank DeJoy, Spectrum Effect. Uh, several members of the panel referred to spectrum sharing in the 3.5 gigahertz band, uh, specifically CBRS and SAS and mm -hmm. sensing. My question is. When do you expect uh, adoption of those solutions to start happening in the market and in what sectors? I can take a stab at what's going on in terms of uh, 3.5 gigahertz. I think the problem statement is well understood and, uh, and the techniques that are needed to make it happen, they are well underway, including the pre-commercial trials. I think the go-ahead really comes down to not really as much on the GA tier, where we know exactly how to share the spectrum, but perhaps a little bit more on the SaaS perspective as to the certification of it, because that's the entity that eventually needs to interface with uh, uh, all the DOD databases and so on. So I think the certification of that probably will be the one that will eventually dictate when it will come in. So I'll leave that to... Leave it to me again. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Um, well, once again, I don't have a date for you, but you know, we, we have the SAS applications in the first round. We're working with them. They're pretty good. We're pretty excited about about them. Once, once we're, we're, going, we're going back to the applicants and asking various questions and trying to get them all to the same standard, but I think the big thing there is going, going to be uh, testing with the incumbent federal agencies and getting them comfortable that the SAS is really protecting them, and we're trying to do that as soon as possible, as always. Right. But I think that's, that's the next step, and we hope to get to that soon. Right, so if you think about it, uh, a lot of our operators are very interested in using it. A lot of our CTIA member operators like Steve's company. Um, so we're working very closely with Paige, and Paige has done a great job helping us uh, work with DOD in a completely new paradigm. Chris's team is working very diligently with the whole industry in terms of putting together kind of a plan, a roadmap. Uh, matter of fact, you close, I believe, at the end of the month with uh, the comments that you and things that you've requested to the SAS uh, providers. I think there's a healthy uh, community there. And then also a plug for Win Forum. There's 56 companies. Qualcomm is involved. Uh, the FCC is involved. Page has got representation. Steve's team's got representation. Um, so pretty much everybody here is pretty interested in that band. So I think you're going to see it develop pretty quickly. And I think you know Chris and Paige are uh, helping us work our way through the details. So hopefully that's helpful. Can I add just a comment? Absolutely. So Remember also in 3.5, for instance, there are exclusion zones. So from an incumbent federal user perspective, to use the SAS and potentially environmental sensing is really for protection within those exclusion zones. And outside those exclusion zones, there are opportunities to operate without having to coordinate with the incumbent right. federal users but the SAS is still an important component right. to the commercial to commercial sharing as well. Right, as soon as we get to the point where it's clear yeah. that the SAS can at least enforce the yeah. exclusion zone yeah. successfully, we can yeah. move forward. Right. But, and, and I'm actually, you may know more about how the Wind Forum is doing. I mean, the Wind Forum's been making great progress, but I think they're still working out some of their protocols like SAS to That's SAS right. interface is still That's being right. worked on by the Wind Forum. It's, it's a standardization, Wind Forum, thanks. I mean, it's a, it's a standardization forum in which we are heavily participating with the rest of our partners in the industry. Uh, it's still ongoing, but there's good progress being made in that one. Uh, yeah, pretty quick progress, to be honest with you. Okay. And last question, because we're out of time. Yeah, we have uh, time for one really quick one here. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Kai with Caribbean Satellite Telephone. Um, I actually have a two-part question. Um, first part is, is there any plans to open up um, 
sub gigahertz spectrum in different regions, say like 900 megahertz for um, 4G or even 5G. And second part is for higher um, bands of spectrum, like you mentioned for 5G for, what is it, 37 gigahertz. Um, what some of the propagation issues do you expect with the higher um, frequency bands? So, let me so was, was the first question sub one gigahertz? Okay, I mean, so the, the, at the FCC, the main thing there is a 600 megahertz auction. I actually think the 600 megahertz auction is potentially a huge 5G opportunity for somebody because they could go straight to 5G <laughs> spectrum. So if you're looking at those types of applications, maybe high coverage IoT, maybe it's a control plane for some higher frequency, I, I think that's the focus, but we don't have other sub one gigahertz bands right now. Um, and the second part of your question, I, I think Charlie talked about that some. I think, yeah. I think we've seen good, I mean, the, the challenge is the higher the frequency, the more directionally antenna has to be to make it usable. But all the advances with beam steering, and, and we're, we're seeing a lot of people saying they can get several hundred meters and maybe even yeah. kilometers. The, the main thing actually in, in these millimeter wave bands is remember it's not, it's not a diffractive channel. What that means is things don't bend around corners. What you really rely upon a lot is on reflections. And you know, in a very simplistic way, think about pointing laser pointers in some sense. I mean, that's how, how thin the beam width can be. And the key is to actually then use that. So the channel itself is well understood, but I think the techniques to utilize the channel to our advantage are also reasonably well understood at this point in time. Great. Well, thank you for attending today. We sincerely appreciate it. I'd ask for a big round of applause for, uh, for our panelists and panelists that sincerely appreciate. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.